Hey everybody, um, I'm really excited about this assignment. I don't know if you could tell. Anyway, um, these are the instructions for your second reading response. So if you remember the first one that we did was the jiffing a character. I thought people did really well on that. Um, I still have to make out your, like, calculate who, which groups did the best guessing with the charades and distribute your little certificates. But I thought people did really well on it, so I'm super excited to see what you do with this second reading response. Um, I kind of put this one off until we had already already discussed the text, because a, a lot of people do use reading responses to check whether you've done the reading, and I'm just kind of over here like, you'll do the reading or you won't. <laughs> and if you don't do it, then you won't perform very well on the test, but like that's not what a reading response is for in my class, okay? I'm trying to get you to engage with the reading, which is a little bit different. Um, and I kind of also held off on this because I wanted to be sure that I got all of the essay portions of test one back to you with some commentary before I asked you to like turn in another written thing, okay? Um, so we had a chance in class uh, yesterday to talk about those a little bit. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with the, the way the class has performed on those. Um, I do want to be aware of the fact that some people may have questions about things that they missed or you may want to go over some terms in particular with me. Um, I'm very open to doing that. Um, I have a pretty open office hours policy. You've got my office hours listed on the syllabus, but I'm also usually happy to schedule time to chat with students at other times. I, a couple of times lately students have said to me, I know you're really busy and I just want to point out like Indeed, I am busy, as many of us are, but I pretty much am here because I want to talk to students. Um, it's kind of the deal. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, th there are times when I'm scheduled to do XYZ thing and I really can't talk to you, but as a general rule, um, I am here doing what I'm doing because I want to interact with students and see you learning things. Like that's, that's, that's one of my goals. Um, so don't feel shy about sending a message, asking a question, so on and so forth. Anyway, all of that to say that what I'm going to ask you to do for, the, your, for your second reading response is first of all related to the Iliad. So we're not going to worry about any of the other things that we've read so far, just the Iliad. And I'm going to ask you, as I mentioned in class, to do a retelling of a key scene. Okay, so you're not going to recap the entire Iliad. That's absurd. <laughs> like, that's that's a whole semester and then some. Okay, like, no. Um, but I'm going to ask you to think about genre when you do it. Um, that's partly because I want to practice some of the stuff about poetics that we've been discussing, and I think one of the easy ways in to helping you work with that term and kind of work with those concepts is to think about style. Uh, like literary style or artistic style, and how that influences our understanding of the narrative that we're that we are receiving. Um, and so, what I'm going to ask you to do is to pick from a selection of key scenes that I identified. Okay, so I went through and picked out. Okay, this scene, maybe this scene, here's a scene. Um, so I'm going to give you those page and line numbers, or give you those selections, and I'm going to ask you to re choose one of those scenes and retell that scene in the style of another genre. So this one is epic, okay? We kind of know that this is a Greek epic and is told in the style of an epic, okay. There are all of these other ways to stylistically present a story and that's gonna matter, that's gonna change how readers might perceive that story. And the list that I've created of possible genres to use is not exhaustive, right? Like it, this doesn't encompass all of the possible genres that you might consider. Um, I tried to pick, first of all, a wide range. So, you know, it hit a lot of different points. Um, and then I tried to pick ones that I thought, okay, at least several people in the class would be familiar with any one of these. But if you've got another genre that you like and that you think would fit really well with a sel particular selection, please feel free to pitch me, right? Send me a message in Canvas or send me an email to my Outlook, um, sgsmith at una.edu, and say, okay, I want to try this genre for this scene. And, you know, if it makes even a little bit of sense, I'll probably say go for it, okay? But I'll tell you the genres first and then the uh, passages that, I'm, that I've selected for you. So the list of genres that I came up with um, includes a romance novel, like a classic romance novel, 
Um, a high fantasy novel, so uh, high fantasy would not include most forms of steampunk, but it would include things like um, Robert Jordan's work, or Robin Hobb's work, or um, Tolkien, of course. Um, who are some other big ones? Piers Anthony. High fantasy is like that kind of fantasy where there are like all of, oh, R.A. Salvatore. High fantasy is where there are like swords and dragons and castles and medieval armor and like that kind of stuff, okay? It's a whole thing. It's a whole section in the bookstore. It, it, for most people, it's kind of, well, I know it when I see it, but this is the kind of fantasy that I'm talking about as opposed to some of the more um, humorous or, you know, cross blended with steampunk kind of things. Not that there's anything wrong with steampunk. Um, okay, so romance novel, high fantasy, a graphic novel. So if you are very much a visual art kind of person and you want to illustrate one of these passages, you have to include captions, okay? It can't be just images. You can't just draw the story. But I'm very aware that visuals are very much a part of storytelling um, in a lot of different contexts. And so if you want to take a gambit at, um, or if you want to sort of, take a go at recapping one of these key scenes with visuals and captions and, you know, like the gutters that separate images like you would have in a comic book, that's a good option. Um, and then this one is kind of out there, but I thought that could be really interesting. Um, so I don't really play Dungeons and Dragons. People invite me and I'm like, mm, there are too many people. If there are too many people involved in a Dungeons and Dragons game for me, that really tells you something about where I am on social interaction, right? But I kind of know how the game is played, and so it often involves, um, in addition to the actual things that the players are doing sitting around the table, the Dungeon Master often also creates these little snippets of narrative to try and move his or her players around the imaginary world. Um... Some of these work better than others. Like my, I've talked to some dungeon masters who are like very frustrated with their players. But if they work well, then they kind of set a scene and position the players within the scene. And if you wanted to kind of drop our characters from the Iliad into one of those areas and be the dungeon master and like move them around the page, I think that could be really entertaining. Um, it requires a little more legwork on your part to do the imaginary, you know, backstory kind of thing. But if you want to go for it, if this is like your jam, I think it could it could potentially work really well. Um, there's another genre of recap um, that I really like, but I'm not sure how familiar students will be with it. So I'll kind of put it out there as like an additional kind of grace note thing. IO9 and um, a, an artist called Oscar Burkaka. Um, I think there are a couple of other people doing similar things, but these are like the ones I'm familiar with. They do recaps of television shows and usually like they, those recaps include like images, like screen grabs or whatever, captioned with like slightly absurd commentary on the, like running commentary on the episode that they are recapping. And it tells the story like, like it literally is exactly what happened in the episode, but with a little tongue in cheek kind of vibe. Um, and there are scenes in the Iliad that, if you are familiar with that genre, uh, enough to use it, they could work really well here. Um, I have a sense that that's kind of a niche genre that not everybody's going to be familiar with. So, um, I'm not, not sold on the idea that a lot of people are going to pick it, but if, if that's your thing, it could work out really well, uh, for this particular text. Anyway. So those are the genres, and like I said, if you've got like something else that you'd really like to try here, send me a message, pitch me your idea, because um, I'm really interested in seeing what you do with style in retelling this narrative. And then these are the selections from the Iliad that I've chosen, and you'll notice when I read out these line numbers that there's a, there is a tremendous gap in like the length of these passages that I'm asking you to recap. I chose them not by length of lines, but rather by the amount of, like, the number of actions you're going to have to describe in retelling, right? So there is quite a bit of disparity between the links on the page, um, but I think the action is about, is like roughly equivalent across all of these scenes. So the first one is just starting at the beginning in our textbook and then going down to line 412. That's the longest selection that I picked, 
but actually not very much happens in it. Like there are all of these super long speeches and not a whole lot else. Um, so unless you just feel compelled to recap all of the dialogue, this should be about the same length as all of these other ones, even though it's nearly twice as long. So then the next selection would be um, book 18, The Shield of Achilles, starting at the beginning and then going down to line 135. Or in that same The Shield of Achilles, book 18, you could also do line 220 to 313 or lines 367 down through 381. That's the very shortest one, but there's kind of, there's kind of, it's packed. Uh, there's a lot to, like if you wanted to spell out all of the actions going on there, um, is actually quite detailed. Um, okay, and then line, uh, line, book 24, which is Achilles and Priam, that's the long negotiation for the return of Hector's body that we discussed. Um, and I'm, I would say lines 334 through 570, that kind of gets us from uh, Hermes meeting with Priam all the way down through the go away old man. So that section that we talked about in class essentially. So, I'm going to post these also in written form, but I really wanted to go through the sort of the idea behind the assignment with you on video. I hope that makes it easier to follow and sort of understand the logic behind it. Usually, not always, but usually when students understand the thought process behind an assignment and what the kind of instructional goals are, usually that makes it easier to get your head around what I'm actually asking you to do. Um, if you watch this and read the instructions and then have questions, uh, I'm happy to talk about the assignment with you. You're not, I'm not too busy to talk to my students and you are very free to ask questions. If you have questions, it doesn't mean anything is wrong. I hope, you know, fingers crossed because not every, not everybody loves uh, doing stuff like this, but I hope some of you at least will, will get a little bit of a kick out of retelling a passage from the Iliad. So, all right, that's it for now. Talk to you soon.